typewriter is a 1908 Woodstock. On it, I've typed 30 years of Sky at Night scripts. And you know, starting a script is very often the beginning of an adventure. Whether it's on the beach near my home. Anyway, let's try it. If I observe, you can work the iris. Jolly good. Right. Or down a gold mine to look at the sun. One mile underground, the mine provides a convenient hole for the astronomers to set up their observatory. Or in a place where I felt completely cut off from life. A hole in the middle of the desert. And what's a game of cricket got to do with astronomy? The weather's played its part. And I've had some very odd methods of transport. So let's now begin our look back at the places we've been and the subject we've covered over these last 30 years with a chapter on comets. I wonder if you remember this, the Arend Roland Comet, the first picture I ever showed on the very first Sky at Night programme, exactly 30 years ago, on April the 24th, 1957. Of course, a lot's happened since then. We've had men on the moon, probes of the planets, and of course, the great new telescopes. And it's been my privilege to follow this exciting time through because I've been on the air with the sky at night once every four weeks since I showed that first picture. Of course, comets always cause great excitement. In 1973 came Kohutek's comet. It was billed as the comet of the century. After the last observations from Seki, we can expect the maximum brightness of this comet uh, to be of about minus four to minus five. That's about the brightness of Venus, in fact. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so this is going to be a really spectacular comet and it's not going to disappoint us. Dr. Kahutek, thank you very much and many congratulations on making this discovery. It's going to be remembered for a very long time. It will certainly be remembered, but not in the way we expected. It was widely regarded as the non-event of the century. There have been plenty of comets since then, but the next really important event in the comet world occurred when astronomers using the 200-inch reflector at Panama in California recovered Halley's Comet as it hurtled inward toward the sun. This was one of our many special programs. We put it on on the night of the discovery. Good evening and welcome to this Sky at Night special. We have really exciting news. Halley's Comet has been sighted for the first time in over 70 years. The discovery was made at Palomar by Drs. Danielson and David Jewett. And um, I'm delighted to say that David Jewett is now on the line to give us the latest news. Hello, David. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you well. Well, first of all, many, many congratulations upon having discovered this comet. How long have you been searching? Uh, we've made about, uh, about four searches from Palomar uh, spread over the last uh, two years. What exactly does it look like? Uh, it looks like a little tiny star. And the only thing which really distinguishes it from being a star is that it moves in the correct direction uh, at the correct speed. And within a day or two, the now famous picture was released to the world. And from that moment on, Halley's Comet was eagerly watched for by professionals and amateurs alike. One man, Ron Arbor, actually moved his telescope for the occasion. When you've got a perfectly good observatory down at the bottom of the garden, why do you shift your telescope here against a wall? From here, Patrick, the comet is quite accessible, but from the observatory, it's completely obscured by a tree, so I had to move it from the observatory to here. And rather easier to move the telescope than move the tree, in fact. That's perfectly true. That must have been quite a problem. It was. First, I had to get permission from the wife to dig out the patio. <laughs> I don't wonder. Halley's is the only bright comet which is reliable enough to be studied at close range by space-age scientists. But nobody yet knew what a comet was made of. Plans to send probes to comets had been made at an early stage, and for Halley's Comet there were several. Two Japanese, two Russian, and this one from Europe, named Giotto, after the Italian painter who, wrongly, showed the comet at the time of the birth of Christ. All the same, it's a lovely picture. Giotto, the spacecraft, was duly launched. And months later, when Giotto arrived at the comet, I was at the control centre of the European Space Agency in Germany to watch the pictures come in from the onboard camera. Before the spacecraft got severely battered, it sent back some remarkable pictures that nobody, not even the scientists working on the project, could understand. But once the pictures had been analysed, it was discovered that the nucleus was dark.
This is one of my lunar observation notebooks. I've been studying the moon ever since I was 11, and obviously we've made many programs about it, and how our ideas have changed. Incidentally, has it ever struck you that the full moon appears larger when low down than it does when it's high up? Well, that's a pure illusion. And we set out to demonstrate this with the aid of Professor Richard Gregory. Now, Patrick's walking along the beach, and he's walking along posts which are in fact equal in height, groins, and he's shrinking at my eye and at the camera. The brain is compensating for this, and to do this it uses information of perspective, texture of the pebbles on the beach, and if it was not something I knew, like the size of Patrick, it would still work. All kinds of odd things happened. You know that generator? Oh yes. We were on the beach here, and of course it was night, a wonderful moon, pitch blackness and you had floodlights and then just as we were getting going the generator started to fail and man-made light disappeared off the scene. Now what we want you to do and only once please is to look at the moon then look down at these stones we can see here and then pick up the stone which you think will just cover the moon when you hold it out at arm's length. And then the courting couples appeared as well. Yes, I remember the courting couples. They were down on the beach for reasons of their own. And I went up and disturbed them. I said, would you mind selecting a stone which you think is going to cover the moon at arm's length and hold it out? And um, they all played very nicely, I may say. They didn't throw things at me, but they all selected stones that were too big by a factor of about 50. Right. And now I will show you the size of the stone, which will just do it for me. A tiny little stone. We devised another experiment to compare the apparent size of the real moon with an artificial one. And the idea is that we place this next to the real moon in the sky and adjust it to the apparent size of the moon. The second trick is that we move the moon up and down optically and judge this against the moon when the moon is high and when it's low. And this involves a second bit of apparatus. Let's have a look at that. Right. Our mirror, which we reflect the real moon. And the moon's quite high in the sky now. We can reflect the real moon off this tilting mirror through which we can also see. And that's a rather cunning trick. It enables us to move the moon up and down in the sky, keep the horizon constant, and also not affect our comparison moon. Well, whether this has been done in quite this form, I don't know. Anyway, let's try it. If I observe, you can work the iris. Jolly good. Right. So first of all, we'll bring the moon down almost to the horizon until it's sitting almost on top of those wooden posts. And now, Richard, will you increase the iris, which at the moment looks much smaller than the moon? Quite a bit smaller. More than that. Increase further. Further still, please. A little bit more, nearly there, a little bit more still. Now, those two now appear the same size to me, although, of course, not the same brightness, because the iris appears much brighter. Now we lift the moon up, and there is quite definitely an apparent shrinkage. There is an illusion there. Of course, our side of the moon has been studied for centuries and photographed for many decades. But we knew nothing about the far side of the moon until Russia's unmanned probe, Lunik 3, went on a round trip. It was on the 26th of October, 1959, that we were able to show the first pictures of the other side of the moon. The Russians had expressed them through to us. But the Americans eventually got there with Apollo 11. Roger, understand. Go for landing. 35 degrees, 750, coming down to 23. A few hours later, Neil Armstrong opened the hatch and prepared to set foot on the moon. I'm going to step off the land now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It was a great honour when he came to join us on the programme and told us what it was like to look back at the Earth. The Earth is quite beautiful from space uh, and from the moon. It looks quite small and quite remote, but uh, it's very blue and covered with uh, white lace and <laughs> of the clouds, and the continents are clearly seen, although they have very little color from that distance. You're one of the very, very few people, I think, whose opinion on this is really worth having. In fact, there are only four of you. Do you think, from your knowledge of the moon, having been there, that it is going to be possible in the foreseeable future to set up scientific bases there on anything like a large scale? Oh, I'm quite certain that we'll have such bases uh, in our lifetime. 
uh, somewhat like the Antarctic stations uh, and similar scientific outposts, continually manned. Well, I hope he's right. We'll have to wait and see. Incidentally, Neil brought with him a piece of moon rock very like this one. Customs regulations were a bit obscure, so he brought it to as being of no commercial value, which I suppose was true enough. There were six more Apollo missions after that, and on some of them we used this LRV or lunar rover. And then a few years later we were joined by another Apollo astronaut, the last man so far to walk um, or sing on the moon. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May. Oh, what a nice day. The lunar dust uh, tends to make everything stick together. It gets in your spacesuit when you get uh, it gets in all moving parts when you get in the spacecraft and you take off your spacesuit which you have to to maintain comfort and then you unpack the rocks and you literally hold nobody here on earth holds the lunar rocks with their bare hands but we did we held them with our bare hands and we could look at look at them we could smell them uh, we could feel them and the lunar dust literally is so fine it penetrates into the pores of your skin and it was many weeks after I came back before I literally could get the lunar dust out, out of my skin. The inner planets, Mercury, Venus and Mars. My mother used to draw magnificent pictures of Martians, and for a long time it was generally believed that there might easily be life on Mars. The sky at night considered the possibility, and um, with the help of Dr. Francis Jackson, we built a Martian laboratory. Well, it's rather unlikely, I think, that any of our higher terrestrial plants would survive under Martian conditions, although it's just possible that some very lowly forms, which we've not yet tested, may. But just to show you the fate of higher plants, I've brought along tonight two cacti. And you can see these here. This cactus has been quite healthily growing under Earth conditions. And you see it's quite a nice, uh, firm-looking sort of cactus. This one here has spent one night under Martian conditions. And I think you uh, can see without any doubt that it's got a distinctly morning after appearance. <laughs> they do look a bit sad. But although Mars does have an atmosphere, I'm afraid we got it wrong. It's much thinner than we believed, and it's made up chiefly of carbon dioxide, which isn't breathable anyway. But we didn't know that until the Viking space probes landed there very much later. Dr. Gary Hunt joined me on the programme as we looked forward to those landings. 